I get excited about these things, man. I mean, I love doing these podcasts because I like talking about construction. I started in the business 10 years ago, and my biggest thing was to go all to the trade shows and meet all you guys and ask all these questions because I was the kid in the classroom that wanted to know as much information about building science as possible. So now I'm, I'm excited. I'm at actually Suprema Toronto, and to the right of me, I've got Joe Innocente, uh, Sales and Market Development Manager for Suprema Wall Systems. Oh, that's a big title. How do you it's- fit that? on the card it's a long card <laughs> it goes around the back actually. and then to the right of you you've got i've got it's myself ben serino ben uh, is back i'm back oh this is nice that i, get, I keep on getting reincurring guests man yeah. that's what's happening right thanks for having me back and, oh. and welcome welcome to our facility i love this office here because i like the back room i like the back room where all the all, all the, the uh, training all happens. the training happens and stuff like that so today we want to talk about building science we want to talk about uh i think joe you said something at one time when we were talking about how you want to build not for today you want to build for tomorrow manny the the real challenge we have is is that we're still not building to the capacity we can why is that joe i've been in the building product manufacturing industry for over 25 years and i've seen the good the bad and the ugly i've seen where we were 25 years ago and i see where we are today and how's it how's that picture hasn't changed much that's sad and i've always joked about this how the construction industry is almost like a dinosaur it is so slow to improve evolve and do better we're so used to using the original obc the building code from decades ago why can't why like tell me joe why can't we better build it all comes down to the the owner of the building who is the owner when they take ownership of the building if they take ownership of the building at the beginning of the process we tend to have a better building if they take ownership after the construction where they haven't been involved i hate to say this but builders tend to take shortcuts so you're talking about the owner being the actual gc the builders themselves not the homeowners the clients the people are going to live in them no the people who are actually going to use them live in them operate them over the life of the building so this is the problem you guys have this all the time people don't care about this man they don't they care about the granite they care about the, the kitchen they care about the beauty mm-hmm. they care about the paint colors i've had a chance to document uh, a few buildings in and around toronto residential construction typically when we see less than code if you want to say it tends to be on the residential side on the commercial institutional and industrial side we see much better construction but the owner, challenging construction the owner is more involved okay the architect is more involved someone is held accountable so why isn't that involved. translated over to resident because i've always said from what i've learned a lot of the good stuff that we see in residential comes from commercial so why can't that aspect of it come to commercial to, to residential that's an excellent point and i always say who is the quality Quality assurance provider. That's a good question. In Who the is construction it? process. Residentially, it's the builder or the general contractor, the building official. The inspector. Yes. And how much do inspectors care about building science? Do we want to piss off anybody right now? No. I don't say they They're don't more care. interested in structural engineering. Yeah. That they're not really, I mean, thermal bridging, how exciting is that? It's not that exciting to them. Not to them, maybe. No. Not to the average homeowner. The building official has a number of things that he has to authorize and check check and go through. They have to know something about everything. Plumbing, HVAC, membranes, safety, the height of the riser for the step, the height of the rail for the the stairway, everything, the fans, the, um, there's 101 things. Things tend to fall through the cracks. And which is? building science health and safety comes first the energy efficiency and the building science comes second but the energy efficiency they're always looking at what the minimum standards are of today which basically are no different than what they were 25 years ago yes and no many so here is the real challenge is that in ontario we have a we have two basic codes we have sb10 for commercial sb12 for residential sb12 has three different tracks that you can go through everyone tends to take the the performance track what's the sb stand for Special bulletin. I see. I never knew that. So finally asked. Yeah. So as part of the Ontario Building Code, SB10 and SB12 are the energy compliant packages. Most people in SB12 take the compliance package. Got it. So you have a number of factors. You go through it. You tick off all the different parts, and then you come out with your your recipe for that building. And the inspector's looking at that grocery list. Exactly. Okay. And then they go through the whole thing. So you get your building permits. You go forward. The problem is under SB12. SB12, you contravene a lot of what's in the National Building Code because the Ontario go- government yeah. has allowed it. Yeah. I was told that the National Building Code versus the Ontario Building Code, which is probably going to be similar to other municipalities, like if you go into different cities, they're two years ahead 
of the provincial building codes. So then things that are not approved just yet in the provincial have been approved in the national or vice versa. SB 10, which is the commercial institutional side of the code, mirrors the national building code. Okay. Very, very similar. But through lobbying, through other actions, builders on the residential side have allowed the government or they've force the government to come up with SB 12, which tends to lower the requirements for insulation. Why? Membrane. But it, why? What's the... It, in hopes of saving a few dollars here and there. Because the reality is that if we don't lower these standards, then most people won't be allowed or financially able to build a house. Is no, that the idea? No, not at all. Man. We're not talking about that kind of money. No, we're so not then talking... Why not keep it at that same level then? Great question. I don't know. <laughs> it's all about the builders. I shouldn't say that. I should cap it. It's not all about the builders. No, it's the whole homeowners, the clients, the users, the end users too. Ultimately, the end user doesn't know how much extra it would cost for yeah. a better membrane package, a better insulation package. That's not being done. Now, I want to put a big caveat here. It's mainly in the greater Toronto area. Outside of the city of Toronto, a lot of the building officials will not allow for all the exemptions in the SB12. Really? So they are building much better outside of the city of Toronto. So why are they so... Yeah, but what I was going to say was, is price really that much of a factor? Because look how much they're spending on building these homes. I, it, it is because... You know what I mean? Because think about it. The average home build, you can tell me, what are they charging a square foot now? On average? Well, there's no such thing as a square foot price, but I'm here that you're anywhere from like 350 to 450 for an average house right so average. to upgrade certain components of your building I you might be increasing an extra 50 bucks a square foot but you're talking about homeowners end users i like that term end users because that's who's going to be using it mm -hmm. they don't see it so if they don't see it they can't justify a check being written for something that's invisible to them but it's not invisible to us it's <laughs> I it's know. not invisible. I know. Until there's a problem. I know. Until there's, <laughs> until there's a massive we, we've problem. We've all grown up. We're, we're all relatively the same kind of generation here. Yeah. We've all grown up in those those older homes that we lived in as kids. And it was we were used to one room being frozen, yeah. one corner being frozen, one room not getting the full heat coming in. I still have the, it in a brand new building right brand, now. And so that's what I'm worried about, the new homes. I know my brother just bought a new home three years ago, and it's terrible. It's absolutely it's ridiculous, right? So, mm -hmm. But that's SB12. So, for example example your brother and ben over here they have a brand new home brand new ben didn't see the home being built he couldn't go there and examine uh, is the air barrier being applied it's properly. actually illegal he can't be on I that can't property be on site. exactly yeah. so who is the quality assurance the builder at that point exactly but and the inspector. How many times do the, does the inspector physically inspect the property? That's the thing. You got a subdivision that has two hundred homes on it. They're not seeing every <laughs> single home. They're, wa it's they're a blanket. casually walking it's a blanket. to every one I, I know. out exactly. of ten. Even for for I'll use electrical as an example. They're part of a program, a quality assurance program. That we we don't want to listen. We, we also don't want to shit on no, the no, building no, no, inspectors. It's, not, it's, not it's a on them. daunting it's, it's too yeah. many homes. They're understaffed. Exactly. It's, exactly. it's a huge problem. It's not. Exactly. It has nothing to do with them. They do a fantastic job with what they have the challenge is there's not enough of them to go around right so we need more of them we need more or they got to get third party involved like they do commercially shouldn't it be a go between the actual inspectors and the builders themselves and maybe that's a division that could be where it's another or that's another cost so depending on the jurisdiction in canada so okay. if you go way out west to british columbia Every building, doesn't matter if it's a single family home or a seven story hospital, every building has to have a building envelope consultant. Really? To inspect. Really? Yes. That's the law. That's the step code in But BC. not here in Toronto. No. Nowhere in Ontario. Well, it's there. funny. When I got started in construction, that was one of the first things I did is I hired a building envelope consult consultant to yep. tell me what I should be doing. Absolutely. Because I didn't know what I should be doing. And if I wanted to build a certain way and I wanted this house to be efficient, the biggest compliment I got from the very first house that I ever did was was demoed a World War II house. So it was like a 1940s kind of house, right? And it was a single bung bungalow, small, tiny, less than a thousand square feet. Then we built a monstrous 5,000 square foot house on that same lot, as we do, where you have the minimum of clearances on either side and you have the minimum clearances on the back and everything like that. We were told after the first year, a year of use of that house, they were spending less energy costs on the new house than they were the old house. Manny... <laughs> That's the essence of that's, building that's science. That said something whole to me. That said a huge amount of something to me. You know what I mean? So it's just like... That is the whole point of trying to build better. We're building better, not for today, but for tomorrow. And the health, safety, the comfort, the energy efficiency, it makes sense. For a minimal cost. We're not talking dramatic cost here to put a 
properly installed air barrier assembly to have the right amount of insulation on the exterior. Well, let's do this. Let's do this, Joe and Ben. Let's do this. Let's start from, what do you guys want to start from? The foundation? You want to go up? You want to start from the roof and go down on where what we should be doing, what is minimum code right now, and what we should realistically Probably be doing. Probably start foundation is always the best way to go. It's we the we build from the foundation. Down. We make a hole. So let's say now we're so used to we just put a little bit of Damp spray, paint spray paint is yes. what we do, right? Which, is, Which yes. I've never done that. I can't stand it. It makes no sense to me. To but me, the, I don't even think a membrane makes sense. I think minimum code. I, I could be wrong. It's just damp proof. No, even no drainage board. You need the drainage board but still. But if you read the code, it's, oh, I, I, I'm just using common I, sense here. I, I, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a building but, science person. But this is the challenge when you're trying to explain to a guy that's building, and this is what they're feeding you. That they price a job or they price a build, saying this is what we're going to do for you. I've gone through this experience multiple times, and they're educating their customer on what they should have, and then they'll call us and says well this is what they're recommending what do you think well if they're just recommending damp proofing that's not going to solve your waterproofing problem it says it in the word yeah are they giving you drainage board no just damp proofing well then how are you going to manage the water that's falling vertically what if it gets stuck hydrostatic pressure there's a number of well, factors that it's, could it's simple that could cause a leak. your first generation iphone was water resistant it wasn't waterproof Proof. and nobody would let that foam fall into a toilet no. But now you can let it fall into a toilet, grab it, and then don't tell anybody. But the problem <laughs> is that it's not waterproof. It's not waterproof. So I agree with you that it was damp, so you but it was some, not waterproof. You need some type of membrane, whether it be liquid or sheet applied. Uh, I think sheet, no? So the code says, in the absence of hydrostatic pressure, and that means as your water table rises, the code is all about uh, where's your water table from a, from a waterproofing standpoint. If the water table is above your footing, you must have waterproofing. Mm -hmm. If your water table is below your footing, damp proofing, that's all that's required. Who determines where the water table is? Not the owner. Doesn't the water table change sometimes? It always Absolutely. Time? Of course. Depending on season. season? We yeah. got a lot of winter this year. We, I'm sorry. We got, we got a lot of <laughs> we snow. We did get a lot of winter. We, we got a lot of snow <laughs> this winter. winter. Exactly. What are we expecting to see a lot of? We're expected to see a lot of water draining down our wall. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean that's where the water table is. No. But hydrostatic pressure works in a number of ways. One is your water table. One is the amount of water that's flowing down your foundation wall. Which you would need a drainage board assembly of some sort to... Uh, so the drainage board helps to move that water. Doesn't mean it helps no. if the water starts to rise. That's why we go back to a membrane. It should be minimum code. Minimum code, minimum. but it's not. But it's not. It's not. Right now, it's just applied uh, spray something. What, what is it with called? With a roller what? or with a spray machine? That's all it is. And I've yeah. seen all the foundation guys come. Yeah, I can take care of that. 500 bucks, I'll take care of the whole. Shh. Yeah. And it's, it's done. asphalt Production. paint. Yeah, that's all it is. Damp proofing in the meaning of, of the word means it stops water vapor from entering into the uh, into the foundation. Not it doesn't water. mean anything about bulk water. It's only water vapor. See, this is a no-brainer to me because we all know that we're not driving horse-drawn carriages right now. I don't have a horse-drawn Mercedes Sprinter out there, <laughs> right? So the thing is that we use our basements. We know that our basements, is it's another third floor to the house. It's not the basement. So right. we want that basement to be bone dry. Mm -hmm. So why would, and I'm assuming to put a membrane and drainage board and to do it properly, we're not talking tens of thousands. We're talking probably a couple of few thousand dollars to do this. At that time, when it's new construction, we've dug the hole and we've got exposed concrete and it's all ready to go. It's not that much more money to do the it. The thing people have to understand, and I think they're doing a better job of doing so, is that the labor cost is still going to be the same, more or less. To put up liquid or sheet applied, it might fluctuate. You Two know, guys, it's a day's work. It's a, they're still there for a certain amount of time. Yeah. And if they get proficient at it, the cost will come down. But then you get a bone dry basement. But then you get a bone dry, and you don't have to worry about any water damage, insurance claims, crack injecting. You don't have to have that You don't that have problem. to go down that road. No. I know. In the short term, it's a little bit more of an investment. But in the long term, you're saving potentially thousands. This one's an easier yourself for clients because they actually physically will see that membrane and they will physically see the drainage board so they can kind of go, hey, here's a check. I see it. Don't worry. You know, yeah. I mean, it's the David Blaine's out there when they start looking at stuff that mm -hmm. they can't see, right? <laughs> so now I want to, we're in the basement. So now we're leaving the basement. But even before we finish the basement, I personally like putting something underneath the concrete slab. Ideally, that'd be the best Ideally. situation. Yeah. So again, here's where the building code comes in. I like, Joe, that you keep on bringing up the building Joe's code, very man. Cold no, I, I, I love you got this the right guy. <laughs> there's exemptions to everything. So some, this is basically a kid who's not catching up to the rest of the class and we oh, just want to make him pass. There are some exemptions in the uh, code that says you do not have to put in insulation under your slab. That makes no sense to me, man. You've got a cold ground and of it's going to go mm -hmm. through a porous material yes. like when you're, concrete. When you're building 500 to 1,000 homes a year, the problem becomes Terrions after 
X amount of warranty programs for anybody who's they're not just familiar. Moving on. I know, I know they're just moving you know, on. But custom home guys, all the all the, the I've seen guys, that in custom homes. Though, you still, see it. They still will not do it, and this is yep. a custom home because what happens is that thousand or two thousand or whatever it is doesn't go into the building; it goes into the builder's pocket. Yes, I, I, thank you. I'm sorry to say, <laughs> but it does. It goes into the builder's pocket, and it's if you're a builder. The term builder means that you're building it for somebody else. If it's Thank your you. home, it's your then name. you should be putting it into the build, right? Not into your pot. That's just my craziness talking about. Yeah, you're, everyone's entitled to make money. But you want that building to, to exist with no problems. Number one question I ask all the clients, I always ask them, how long are you going to live here? And nowadays, if you're going to, yeah, I, 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 and a lot of people want to move. I know a lot of people want to move, but especially with the real estate right now and how things are going, a lot of people want to find their little nook and they want to stay there for a while, especially if they're a young couple and they've got a small family. They want to stay there until the family, the kids move out and get out of there, but they are going to be there for a decade or two. You should really be looking at little things like this, and these little things will increase your budget, but they're important to do. It's for the health and safety, the longevity of the building, your satisfaction of well, longevity of your family, because what happens in the building is a direct reflection of what happens to you as a family because we know that in the summer months a lot of people close up their windows and they live in a air conditioned yep. climate in the winter months they live in the heat climate so then you're basically like a vacuum you're stuck in this yep. house and you're breathing in no and out changes no air changes no nothing. nothing i know we have hrvs and we can go through that hole li that's later another... on but that's that's something else so it's like mm -hmm. why not i keep on asking why not and i get it the clients do not see what we're doing to make it better. So Manny, there's a term that I like to use. People say, oh, I'm building to code as though they're reaching for the stars. Mm -hmm. I've met Look what uh, I'm doing. code. What is the real definition of code? It's the Christian. worst possible quality building you can build according to the law. It's the <laughs> worst. What, what I was taught was take, an open, uh, take a full glass of water and put it on the edge of a table, right at the corner of the table. That's the minimum building standard. Why not put that glass in the middle of the table that you know that? And it's true. Yeah, you're totally right. It's the worst that we could possibly build to meet their standards. Uh, yes, exactly. Why? That makes no That's sense. That's the to question me. we keep asking. It's so, how do we build better? So what would we put? We we would put what rigid styrofoam poly underneath the slab before we actually pour. Yeah, minimum exactly. two inches. Uh, minimum two inches. Unextruded. Tape the joints. Uh, XPS, ship exactly. lap. Ship lap. Get it all ready. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. I love the idea that you you set up all this 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 foam on the ground right onto mm -hmm. the the gravel base right, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're walking on foam, and then you're going to mm -hmm. pour concrete. And well, you look a concrete look slab. what people are doing after the fact. They're insulating between their floor, their finished floor, and the concrete slab because. What why? It's cold. The concrete slab is cold. It's always cold because the concrete cold. Is, is a sponge. So people are putting some type of insulation, rigid I, insulation. I get DMs all the time asking me, listen, my basement's really cold and we want to put mm -hmm. some tile down on the concrete. Uh, is there anything Which else we should worse. do before? Yeah, and I was it. like, well, uh, before you put the tile, I'll separate it. Yeah. yeah. You can't break up the concrete, but at least you can separate the fact from the concrete mm -hmm. to the finished flooring. And it'll be cheaper even just to heat your floor, whether that it's water better. or electric. You got some type of insulation between the concrete and... That's all we care about is separating the elements from outside to the elements from inside and vice, mm -hmm. vice versa too when you're, you know, like I know that we build mostly for the winter months here, but we still have to pay attention to the summer months, mm -hmm. right? So we're getting hot summers, that like really long yeah. hot summers now. You know, you can't have that typical setup where it's bad insulation, all of a sudden poly on the inside and you got the AC going for five months. We know condensation is forming inside there, right? Absolutely. If we're leaving the basement, we, we should put a membrane, we should put drainage board, we should put the, the rigid on the floor uh, before we pour the concrete. Yes. Now we're on the first floor. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh now, you missed oh, one part. What's that? The walls, your basement walls. How what? much insulation? On Where the should you walls. put the insulation? Yeah. Mm. That comes uh, to be a little bit of a tricky question. A lot of people say you put the insulation on the outside, which is fine. The problem is we only insulate up to grade on the outside. How about the other four feet of that concrete wall, which is just a magnet for cold air? And then it's going to bring it right down to the rest of the wall. So if you can't insulate completely from the exterior, which a lot of people don't, because now you have all this exposed insulation. Why not go from the inside? That's what we should do. With spray foam. Spray foam. We have a number of rigid boards mm -hmm. as well. Polyiso. Polyiso. Why can't we roll out that four foot roll of uh, bad insulation that's uh, hammered to that Taped, ram set, the R20 squished really two? tight to the concrete. Is it R22 now? That, it's it's that R special? crap, is what it is. No, it's just, actually, basement is R12. R12. Oh, is it R? Is R12. It? If it's a no, no, I was told no, that I if think you it's actually, higher because it's I actually it was stamped, it's stamped yeah, on the I, I poly now. Yeah, but that the way they strap it. I mean, I don't, I don't it believe it's no whatever way. R they tell it's me. It's not but right. <laughs> it probably performs like an R12. So we should definitely get rid of that and then spray foam the whole assembly and ideally tie it into a spray foam that's at the bottom underneath the concrete slab. So spray foam is fantastic number one choice huge fan now the other option 
Mm -hmm. A really good option if you don't want to bring a spray foam into the equation because that requires specialized labor, a special contractor to come and do it. Certified guys, not fly by night guys. Time away from your house. You can do very similar, not identical, but very similar by using uh, a foil face polyiso cyanurate board right up against your concrete wall. How thick is that stuff? Inch and a half to two inches. And that'll give you an R value of what? Um, Anywhere from R10 to R12. Really? Then you strap your walls with your two by fours, and then you can fill it in with whatever you want. A bat material or something like that? Bat, cellulose, foil face polyiso is a vapor barrier, a really, really good vapor barrier. Stops all that warm air from getting to that warm, moist air from getting to that cold concrete wall. So you would do the floor, the pour the concrete, and then tie in that foil face right to the bottom? It's it's hard to tie in what's under your slab with, with, uh, with what's on your wall. Unless what's, what's the name of that product there? The, the Soap Rice So V Alu. I've seen that stuff before. It comes in different thicknesses, right? Oh, yes. whatever thickness yeah. you need. Okay. All right. So you actually, that's a pretty cool assembly. If you don't, because I know some clients recently are not big fans of spray foams because we've heard the horror stories and people right. can, you know, there's this thing called YouTube out there. So they mm-hmm. just follow along and mm-hmm. just look it up and all of a sudden yep. they hear those horror stories. Everyone wants a car crash instead of the truth, right? Yep. So the reality is that spray foam, it's done properly from a, com- a company that has proper, like everything's yep. set up properly. It does not fail. It's not going to scare you. It's not going to be anything Correct. like that. It's the guys who do it cheap, fast, and quick. They're the ones that disappear, and then it becomes a nightmare. If they don't want the spray foam, that foil-based product is a great it's, product. It's fantastic. As You're long- losing, what, two inches on, off the wall. Exactly. But you want to build your framing off the concrete wall anyway. You don't want to build it right tight to it. You've got it. Right. Even even with spray foam, you want to leave it about an inch off the concrete wall. Thermal so bridging. Thermal bridging. Exactly. You want to get the spray foam in behind the stud. So you're not losing that much space if you're going with a foil face product. And you have a really warm... Okay, so we have a dry, comfortable, comfortable warm basement. Mm-hmm. And we're, the key here is not only is it warm, it's comfortable... It's safe. Yeah. What's the biggest problem with basement walls? It's molded mildew forming in behind the insulation on that concrete. Unaware. You don't have no idea? You have no idea no until idea. you start to smell it years down the road. The only way to remedy that is you got to strip everything, everything down. Everything out. And mm-hmm. what's the cost of that? So uh, that's expensive. It's a lot more expensive than doing it properly the first time. But back, again, the clients can see that, so they'll write a check, right? It's the David Blaine things that they're yeah, worried about, right? Exactly. That's just the truth. So, we're, okay, we're out of the basement now. Mm-hmm. First floor. First opportunity that we actually get to... Actually, before we leave the basement, how do you guys feel about ICF? Oh, I love it. Wonderful. It makes sense mm-hmm. because that's basically what you're creating there is an yep. ICF, right? I haven't done it yet. I want to do it. I know some guys online that they're doing it and they, they live by it and they love great. it and it's great. But it, it has the same principles. Manny, I'm going to put my hand up here. My house, from the footing to the roof line, complete ICF. Really? Yes. You're going right to... Really? I have you one that wall high, that's yeah? uh, 27 feet of solid concrete construction. Holy cow. How's the sound? It's, <laughs> it is... You don't hear anything outside. It's a very comfortable house. Sturdy because, first of all, it's reinforced concrete. Insulation both on the exterior and the interior. But you have to remember about ICF. I will say this. It's more expensive. takes longer. From a design standpoint, it's a little bit more complicated. But... If you're willing to invest the time and the money, wonderful. If you're not, you can get very similar attributes with conventional construction. There's a way of doing it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And conventional, because there's so many people out there, it's fast, secure, you know the quality of the construction. So there's actual fantastic attributes for ICF, but you could get very, very similar with conventional. But if you were to build it again, would you go the ICF route or would you go probably go the <laughs> ICF route? Eh? That's a good question. But both are right. If you follow the rules for conventional, it's just as good. Really? Yes. But it's slightly cheaper. Cheaper and faster. There is one aspect of ICF that you can't get in conventional. What's that? That's the structure. You're talking about six and a half inches of, of reinforced concrete. concrete insulated on both sides that structure is phenomenal you will not get any other way but you're paying for it all right it's good to know and we have membrane that can waterproof that as well first floor we got a tie and let's go traditional because not everybody's doing icf but so now we got the first wood we got joists we got rim board we got uh our studs Mm -hmm. and now we got to tie that into the concrete foundation right Mm -hmm. so i know we're so used to just putting poly underneath the sill plate (laughs) (laughs) there's nothing wrong with that is that anything wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that no that's the building code. That's what you have to do. You always want to separate your wood from your concrete. But just the that's six standard. mil poly, that's it? Isn't that's there all a, you need to do. That's all is fine. Uh, we're, we're just trying to make sure you don't get any wicking of water from the potentially from that concrete up into your wood, that it will rot it out over its over time. life. Mm-hmm. That's it, right? 
Okay. That's that's well, really more sense to put a membrane other than poly. It's like I seen this. It's a little bit of a, a sill gasket. A sill gasket. Yeah, thank you. a sill gasket. Mm-hmm. Right, but the yeah. thing is, it's exactly five and a half inches, and it, like it just. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking at it, going, why isn't this wrapped around the sill plate? Like an air vapor barrier product, something like that. I don't know. Wouldn't it make more sense? Personally, we I always wrap. I don't know how you would detail that though. Because I the, always wrap my wood with a uh, with a waterproofing product. Suprema has a number of them. Our coal fiend three thousand, our stick from underneath, and then bring no, it right around. When you're putting it right on top of the. I of always the wrap my my wood with that uh, air and vapor. I, I did that. I did that on garage openings and door openings. I did it the oh, on the, the openings. Yeah, the bottom, I understand. The, I'm the talking bottom about foot the bottom yeah. sill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I always it's still the same. You do that too. I rather do that instead of a sill gasket. Yeah. A sill gasket to me, I know it's convenient. You get the two by six lumber. Yep. You staple the sill gasket on it. You flip so it over. you're adhering it to the underside of the, the wood underside. first. And then yeah, you put the it on. No, yeah. no, no, no. Oh, no, if you do it that way, yeah. then that's fine. But you wrap it, it. But what I have a problem with is it's exactly five and a half inches. So then it's exactly oh. on the corners. So then you're basically saying, no, water's going to get around there. Oh, water's going to get through for sure. You I like to wrap it up the sides. Up and over. Yeah. That's what's important. So if there's any leakage, uh, the wood's not going to get wet. So we've got the wall, the first assembly wall, and you got the rim board, right? What are we cladding? I know I, there was a joke in the first build that I did, but um, there was a build going on right next to us, and they were using a uh, quarter inch OSB. <laughs> so <laughs> we saw, yeah, I know. We'll just let that sink I in ju- for a I little bit. I just got that right. <laughs> quarter inch OSB for the exterior sheathing of the house. Quarter inch OSB for the exterior. This is stuff that I use for like templating or just raw shit that I want to draw a line and I want to cut it right it's or protection a, board. A quarter inch OSB. And we had a lot of rain when they were framing, and my framer had a joke, and he said, "Don't worry, with all this rain in about a week or two, that'll be half inch OSB." <laughs> <laughs> So I think it's fair to say that um, quarter inch OSB, which is the building code standard, is not good. It sh- we shouldn't be doing that. We should no. be using what, like like, like I, I, an insulation product of some sort, a rigid insulation product. So Manny, the point of the exterior sheathing, one of the there's two major reasons for it. First, it's structural. It stops the building from wanting to rack. So you put your exterior sheathing. That's part of your structure. Second, the point of that exterior sheathing is so that you can anchor your membranes, your air barrier to it a lot of people forget we need a barrier (laughs) to put on that air barrier yeah so if you remove that structure that component you have to replace it with something so if you're going to use which i think is by far one of the best exterior sheathing product which is an insulated exterior sheathing board what board is that i've seen this board right it could Mm -hmm. be xps which is uh, extruded polystyrene it could be polyiso very similar to what we spoke about using in the basement there's a number of different products could be uh, eps expanded polystyrene and this comes in what thicknesses you want it to be a minimum what half inch no you want it to be a minimum could be express g if you're asking me what the minimum should be. I don't want to do minimum, but I want to let everybody know what the minimum mm-hmm. should be. My opinion, minimum is two inches. Good. I agree with you. Because That's less than that, I wouldn't say purpose. you're wasting your money, but you're not getting the full effect of that exterior in- insulation. And if, again, let's take a look at the code outside of SB12, the minimum is two and a half inches. Really? Yeah. yeah. So from there, you've got this, it comes in sheets of what, four by eight, four by nine? Yep. Four by eight. And then you you tape them, the joints? You would attach it, uh, mechanically attach it. To your framing. You would, the next question you have to ask yourself is where is your air tightness uh, barrier? Is it behind? Is it on the sheathing? If you're using insulation board, it's going to be on the face of the insulation. That's your air barrier, the face of the insulation. Therefore, you're not just taping it, you're detailing it for as an air barrier you can't just use regular tape you have to use uh, a membrane you have to be aware of all your penetrations you have to be aware of flashing all your windows and doors so you're going to detail it as though it's a proper air barrier assembly yeah you have to i mean we all have holes in our house like those holes are called windows and doors and mechanical Mm -hmm. holes but we need to detail them properly otherwise they become an issue later on so here's a really good example about detailing properly and understanding the different types of membranes there's a building I think it's like a multifamily residential building. It's being built in uh, Newfoundland. And what they're doing, they use really good air barrier material, but they use that to wrap the openings. Okay. That means your sill of your windows, your jams, and, and your header. Brought right inside. Brought right inside. They place their windows, flange windows, they tape the edges, and all of a sudden the windows are leaking. Why? Why are the windows leaking? Why? Great question, Manny. <laughs> windows are designed to have a a weeping structure within the window. So water gets there, 
It runs down a drainage channel. And it comes out. It comes out. Where does it come out? Sometimes it, it comes out the bottom of the window. Why or how are we supposed to detail the sill? First, they're supposed to be angled. They're supposed to have a positive drainage to, to the outside. So either you put an end dam on the back or you have a sloped opening. So any water that gets there is going to find its way out the face of the wall. They didn't do that. The next part is your, that sill at a very minimum should be waterproof. Air barrier products, a Tyvek, Typar. The problem is if you don't waterproof that opening, any water that gets into the window and drains out it's may dry. drain it's gonna back sit in. There. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to sit there. Yeah. So an air barrier product is not waterproof. Tyvek is not a waterproofing product. There's two different things here. There's the air barrier and then a waterproofing barrier. Correct. Right? And we have to address both of them on every single protrusion that's in a house, window, exactly. door, mechanical. What's the solution to this situation in this building in Newfoundland? The How only they solution is you have to remove every single window. Okay. Yeah. You have to waterproof minimum the sill. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you have to reinstall the windows properly. That's really expensive when you're talking about uh, 110 windows. So why wasn't it done when it was done the first time? No quality control. Yeah. No quality control. You assurance. guys have a product that I love and I learned really early on was those, I don't know what the official name is, those little, um, uh, the red zone corners. Correct. What are they called? The gussets? Are they gussets? Uh, no. They're, they're uh, the, the bottom from, corners. From Resisto? Yes. They're the little corner guards, whatever. Uh, the exact name, I, I can't remember. Uh, they're, they're ingenious. That's perfect. The I preformed that. corners. Correct. They are a two godsend. and a half inch, two and a half inch, or whatever. Yeah. If you if you've ever had to take a membrane and do a proper corner with the cuts, the oh, gussets, you, you can't and do everything, it. You can't do it. It oh, you can. It, it's a little mm -hmm. bit more difficult. Yeah, but but that corner is amazing. I love it. Designed specifically for that. For that. Mm -hmm. When I started using them and everyone started paying attention to them online, they're like, ask me, where, where is that? What is that? And where can I get it? What exactly. I need that. Because it's such a simple thing. It's not expensive and it solves a huge problem because that's where the water is going to build up in the bottom. Exactly. Part of that quality assurance, which is your insurance policy against water leaking into your house at those little details, those things you'd never think of. And not all the defects, everything that happens is because people are not paying attention to the detail pay attention to the details and your house your building will function so well for years and years and years your house is a living breathing thing right and it's not designed that you build it right off the bat and then we walk away and that's it done you use it you have to maintain it you have to take care of it you have to see where the problems are going to be but when you're building it brand new you should really be paying attention to a lot of these things that are not the pretty things of the house so manny you had mentioned something a little while ago What's that? About older homes and newer homes. Older homes, we use different types of building materials. Newer homes, we use lightweight, moisture-sensitive materials. So the OSBs, a steel frame, yeah. different types of wood products. These are all lighter weight to make the construction le less expensive, of course. But they're all very moisture-sensitive. The membranes, the air barriers, the waterproofing, your roofing products are so much more important now than ever before. Making sure that it's watertight, airtight, paying attention to the details. If you don't do that, these houses will fail. They won't become century homes. No. That's the scary thing. That's what I learned really quickly when I started looking at these new homes of subdivisions. And we're talking 80s. I would say, am I fair to say that? And I don't want to piss off people, but the late 70s to early 80s is where that shift of uh, I don't care anymore started. You know, where they started building houses faster and they didn't care about quality control. Was it around that time? So back in the late 70s, early 80s, we put something in the walls that really messed things up. It's called insulation. We put insulation in the wall without thinking about the consequence of all the other elements within that wall. Once you put insulation into your walls, you make the outside of your walls that much colder. So what happens? We drive all this warm, moist air into our wall. The insulation does its job, keeps the heat in, but allows the air and moisture to pass through. It hits a cold surface on the exterior of our buildings. And what happens when air, moist air, hits a cold surface? I know this one. <laughs> <laughs> condensation condensation that lovely word condensation will destroy construction manny the number one enemy of all buildings water mm -hmm. moisture moisture that's what it is i know moisture and it's becoming even more important now because of the type of building materials we're using we're making the home so tight and now we introduce the hrv and now we purposely are sucking all the air adding out of there humidity and into adding the more and humidity and all this other stuff manny, right so. i wish we were making the homes more airtight we're not properly tight and mechanically working for that tightness. 
So there's one thing that we are not doing that we may be doing in the near future if the code uh, comes out the way What's we expect that? it. That means we're going to be testing for air tightness. Really? Yes. So that means in in our industry, we call it a blower door test. Wait a minute. I, I've always done this. <laughs> You've done it. <laughs> From so the that's... beginning. I've always brought in the guys and I've done four. I'll, I'll I've always done there. four. I've done it at the very beginning. One, two, seven, we've I, done it? Yeah, I've done it in, in the middle of the stage, pre-drywall, after drywall, and completion. It's always four tests that you've done because I want to know what the, the bar is. I want to know where we're going to start and where we're going to end and why. We want to know where the holes are. How many air changes per hour do you normally get on your home? The nice thing is the very first one that I did was a, a strict forward like, uh, HVAC system system right yep. we ended up getting 0.07 wow well very good i know, you know I, what? I, I was they were surprised for a first time builder you got 0.07 i was like is that a good thing is that a great thing i don't even know what the fucking <laughs> i don't know what that number is right but then they explained it to me and i found out yeah it's a good thing do you know what the average air changes per hour on a if it's you want to say a, to be a builder home is 2.5 isn't it supposed to be oh you're getting five to seven air yeah. changes per oh hour. my god like are double. you serious i thought oh, yes. the code was 2.5 oh what, what, what? <laughs> we we spoke about the code already what do we say about the, the non-enforcement <laughs> of the code you're getting and they're passing homes that are getting five because there's seven? no there's requirement no in the building code yeah. it doesn't matter about that it's so it's you're saying that they may be bringing that in yes mm-hmm so is that going to make a lot of builders uh, wear a lot of diapers? Like, <laughs> like are, are they going to be freaking no, out? I think I think they're going to be happy. To uh, be honest with you, I think it's going to create another industry. People making money. You think so? Oh, for sure. First of all, the the air tightness test, the blower door test. We're not talking about stupid, expensive tests here. No, we're not. We're not. They're no. hundreds of dollars, if that. Right. Only hundreds of dollars. Right. Yeah. So they're not crazy, and it's worth doing it in yes. your own home. Even if you've got an existing home right now, and you're curious about where where are all my holes right now, and then you can do that test and get it done and find yes. out exactly. And you may even be able to solve some problems. Some. Right? Yes, you can. You. you know, but the, the bigger problems are the wall assembly, the windows, the windows yeah, and the doors, doors. and like that. Obvious right? things like that. So I'm just assuming. Builders are going to get nervous about having one more body into the mix saying, listen, you got to build this way from the beginning now. And then they're going to say, well, now you're taking think, money out of my pocket. I don't think they're nervous that they're coming. I think they'll be nervous because of scheduling and trying to get the home. So it finalized. takes a little bit longer. It's a little bit long. They're already pushing homes and delaying homes three oh, or four times. You know what I mean? Like I whatever closing date, if you're buying, if you've gone through the process of buying a new build, they give you a potential closing date and they have the ability to push that date three times without. You know what I learned paying. early on about how long it takes the average 2,500 square foot builder grade house? Like, Two years. No, no, the time from the actual dig to to move in, 19 weeks. 19 weeks? That's the average. Wow. 19 weeks. It took me two years to get in on both, on three occasions. 19 weeks, man. I, 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 like 19 weeks, There's uh, that's scary to me. That to build is a scary. house, 19 weeks. Well, you see yeah. these shows out there, they'll build a house in seven days. I, we won't get into the shows. <laughs> <laughs> so, Manny, the biggest challenge will be in the residential side. And again, we're going to separate residential from commercial. It's in the sequencing. Right yeah. now, who's the major air barrier installer in residential? The masonry guy. It's your masonry. And how do they do it? <laughs> they, set up their, <laughs> they set up their scaffolding. Uh, some of the guys are pretty talented because I see them with a cigarette. I see them with the trowel, and I see them with a staple gun, and, and I'm like, they're they're not doing that bad, you know, with like three hands tied behind their they're back. They're great with brick. They're actually really good, but I yeah. agree with you. Uh, a mason, as good as they are, should not be handling the building envelope. The problem is, how do you inspect the air barrier as they're putting up the air barrier and immediately putting their I, I did up. it. I actually did it. I was up there on the scaffolding and as they were working, because I couldn't get up to those higher spots because I didn't want to do it on a ladder. Mm -hmm. So I go, I'll wait for the scaffold to show up. Scaffold shows up and then I got up there and I started taping it using a membrane and putting this and getting it all ready and making sure it was all now sealed. Now imagine the a big construction job. Well, that's, I know. Or time. I know. You know, these guys are not waiting. They're looking to fill that hole with a I'm body. I'm not 19 week guy. I'm 90 week guy. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's like, yeah, that's just how it they're, is. They're already under enough pressure to finish that. You know, again, it always goes back to time and how they price it. We talked about this before. They price a job a certain way, and you only have so much time allocated to finish that job. A minute past. What so, was what's our problem here? Money. Should we be trying to educate the homeowners or the builders? Who's more important, or should we be educating both of them? It comes down to legislation. I hate to say it. it they the won't government get has to step in, really? and they have to say, this is minimum. The next thing that we're going to be seeing is the big change. We're going to actually start rating every building. 
putting that rating into a log somewhere. Rating. A rating. 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 A rating. Like a gold star rating. From, <laughs> like, for example, from A to G. G being the absolute worst energy pig there, and A being a gold star. I think in this market, you're probably going to have to go all the way to A to the Z or Z, whatever uh, you want to choose, right? <laughs> Maybe even lower than that, <laughs> uh, double Z. <laughs> the point is that you as a building owner, a potential buyer, a developer, someone could go somewhere and say, what is the energy rating of that building, of that home, of that commercial I structure? thousand percent agree with you that that should be a part of the house when you're trying to sell it. Part of the buying process. Yeah, Part of the building be. process. So you know exactly this gives me a C rating. Therefore, it's going to cost me or we're going to use 110 kilowatt per year. Or this other building that I'm looking at, this other home, is an A rating. I'm only going to use 20 kilowatts. I would be fascinated by that information being on and that. They could on, sell on it that, as an extra. Sell sheet. I totally. But what's more important to the homeowners Dials. is who's living in that neighborhood. The demographic, financially speaking, living in that neighborhood. That's what they care about. You know what? And I don't even think they have a choice an anymore, though. The people that are first-time home buyers, they don't really have a choice where they can buy. Do you guys think that's the first-time home buyers or kind of... It's funny. I've got, like, we're launching the website soon, and I've got a millennial couple writing an article about buying their first house and i'm very oh, fascinated to, to find out what their thoughts are on that because i don't think the first time home buyer is paying attention to what we're just discussing right now they have no clue they have no i'm, I'm sorry i keep on going back to david blaine and i'm not teasing them or anything like that but they don't want to see it they don't care they don't care about it right so i think it's the second home i think it's when the baby shows up i think once the moment the baby shows up and they start feeding that baby all that organic food and taking care of all that stuff and going to the specific healthy butcher and all this other shit then they're really going to care about their house and the room and the baby's Quality room and the air, quiet, everything yeah. like that the first millennial one they freewheeling man just they don't care just get me in. get me inside the house and make sure the, the the mortgage was approved i can give you a great example my son and his wife bought their first house and number one issue what what could we afford that's the bottom line mm -hmm. but what do they sacrifice i don't think they have a choice location location <laughs> location right that's the number either you're going to move extremely f far from the city or you're going to live in a part of the city that is not too favorable. But I'm not even on that grocery list, I guarantee you, if they had that rating on there, they'd be looking at homes and they're going, but honey, look at the rating on this one. Who cares about the rating? Just get me in the but house. But that's their decision. I know. If they're looking at identical buildings in an identical area and one has a B rating and one has an E rating, maybe the one with the B rating can ask for a little bit more money. That's true. It's actually, it's a great point. I hope they do that. That'd be really amazing to do that. Well, it's being done in Europe for over 10 years already. Oh, there's a lot of things being done outside of North America. <laughs> They're starting in BC. Really? Yes, BC's they are. Why is BC BC's first leading, over Ontario? I don't understand that. BC is very environmentally driven. Yeah, I know. I've been to their beaches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very. If you want to take a look at the future of building codes. BC. BC's the BC the step code. Really? Mm -hmm. Because they're on track by 2032. 2032 is not that far away. No. Okay. That all buildings have to be net zero compliant. That's and when is huge. Ontario going to be looking to do that? That's the next phase in the new National Energy Code or the National Building Code. BC is following what's going to happen in the National Building Code. The rumors are that Ontario should come out with their next code revision in a year or two, and it should be very similar to what's happening in BC. So we'll be close to 2032, or are we going to be 2042, 52? 20, 2032 is the federally mandated date to have all buildings net zero ready. Wow, that's amazing. So mm -hmm. imagine, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what net zero means, an average building, home, commercial building, will uh, their energy intensity, so the amount of energy they use per kilowatt per year, is uh, between 180 and 130 kilowatt hours per year. Per year? Per year. That's per year? Per mm -hmm. year. A washing machine will use that in what? Probably a year. <laughs> that's Maybe insane. That's the what is the current? That's that's current. That's your energy intensity. Okay. Right? Okay. Your, it's called Teddy. T E D I. A net zero <laughs> building. The energy intensity is fifteen kilowatts. Fifteen kilowatts. Really? Yeah. I rather have Sorry. a house like that today. Fifteen than kilowatts. Year, fifteen per years now. square meter per year. Wow. So an average well. building is using 180 to 130 kilowatts per square, square meter. meter per year. Per year. And so a net zero is 15 per square meter per year. One-tenth the energy. Oh, my God. That's net zero Can already. we build to that standard today? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Of course we can. Absolutely. Why aren't we building to that standard today? 
because people don't understand. There's the lack of knowledge, the lack of user. understanding. So how do we educate these morons? You can educate them. It takes a lot of time and effort. Why not just mandate it? It's, it's a lot easier. Government legislation. It's a lot cheaper to do that than it is to charge people a carbon tax. That's a different group of morons, though, the politicians, right? Well, that's the thing. If we really want to be environmental, right we now. We should be. Currently, Manny, you have to remember, 50% of all the carbon that we use goes to heat and cool buildings. The biggest impact we can have on the environment today, right now, is make your buildings more energy efficient. We can cut that carbon footprint dramatically So every, sing, every single home right now is just basically a, a huge carbon footprint right now. Essentially. Yes. And then there's a small percentage of uh, actual conscious homeowners that spend the time Correct. and effort and build their house properly mm-hmm. and do all these details and Correct. get that net zero kind of rating yeah. on it and then have a there much more... There are passive efficient. home builders out there. Yes. Passive home is a slightly different thing, though. It's a bigger animal and, and that's a whole other world. You guys goal, want to talk a little bit about that? or Passive home is, is an interesting topic. As Ben mentioned, there are some people who are currently doing it. There's a great example in Edmonton of a car dealership who actually went to the passive home side. They created a car dealership. Their whole building is considered passive home. Wow. The way you calculate uh, a passive home, of course, is uh, en- energy intensity. But then you have to juggle. Uh, and the biggest issue we have with respect to uh, net zero ready, passive home, your window to wall ratio. How big do you want your windows if you want your building to be to be more en- en- energy efficiency Small. technically you have to reduce the, those windows yeah but homeowners don't want less glass they want more glass manny you're you're right in many respects people love that natural sunlight when it comes in they'd love to look out their window to their ravine or to their backyard or to their neighbor not the neighbors <laughs> no but they do but you're right though you have to reduce that glass you know we have to go back to the days where we had smaller punched windows houses still work people still lived in them you can't have everything here's the key the more windows you have the more insulation you have to put into your walls in between those windows exactly so this dealership they needed some larger windows first thing you orient the windows to the warmer side south or west so hmm. you get all that solar radiation or that solar gain you get during, the radiant heat coming during into the, the winter building. exactly yeah. and then because they needed larger windows okay what do we have to insulate our walls to to make up for those windows they went to an r60 60 r60 walls. how thick is that wall 12 inches 12 inches, 12 12 inches yeah, yeah. Wow. Of solid insulation. But they obtained passive, a passive rating. And this is a commercial building. This is a commercial building. Because you're assuming a dealership would have a lot of glass. Mm-hmm. Correct. Right? Because you got to see the cars. You got to yes. walk in there. So then they actually just made the walls a little thicker. It's and if orienting. they built it. So if they would have built it regular, it just would have been thinner walls and the glass would have been on the wrong sides. Absolutely. And then it would not have been efficient. And then that's, that's just a waste, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we should be looking at that. I mean, passives for another talk for to get into more details right. of that. I want to get to the roof assembly now. So now we've taken care of the walls. We've taken care of the foundation. I want to get the roof. The roof is extremely important. We mm-hmm. have to tie in our walls to the roof and get it all together and then make sure the roof is all done. Pro- gone are the days, because I was joking about this on the last podcast with you, Ben, with with Mark and Skylux, has like gone are the days of tar paper, no? Yep. Are guys still, I'm assuming I mean, they are, they're probably the same guys that are using green shingles. <laughs> they still make them. I was surprised to see that, but they still make it because there are the Portuguese and the Italian guys out there. <laughs> They still use Funny it, enough yeah. is the Irish guys are not using green shingles. You no. Know? No. How do we building envelope the roof and tie it into the wall structure? How do we get that properly done? Because I know we talked about this the other day. I think we were talking about how all the trades have to get along. We all got to, like, roofers have to get along with the masons. The masons have to, you know, everyone's got to get along with the framers. and Everyone's got to get along. Mm-hmm. You can't just build your job and then walk away and don't care about it. And let, let them figure out how they're going to tie it together. So how do we assemble this roof and then how we tie it into the wall? Yeah, I think like you said, I think it's just a matter of making sure we communicate. First, we got to specify the correct product. You know, depending on the build, if it's a if it's residential, it's one thing. You're not really, you're still going to use some type of underlayment that can physically tie into the air barrier assembly. Or if it's a flat roof we have our air barrier product as well that will have to tie in it's just a matter of communicating with these guys and making sure that whoever where does it stop where does it finish well like the roof is where's the responsibility yeah. sort of lie but uh, like you're talking about i'm always fascinated how some homeowners don't want to spend the time and effort and especially the money on the roof but it's the one surface of the house that's going to get beaten up the most by mother nature by heat by rain 
Yeah, but then you also got, you got your, your granulated shingle or your modified roof. But it, then you got your attic space. So, I mean, do we do what's known as a hot roof application? Do we do as a blown-in application? How do we do it so then we can... Do we vent that roof line? Do we not vent it? Like, it all goes... I mean, we haven't even dove into um, insulation itself. Like, Is that I'm where not you a, position the insulation I, too, Joe? Yeah, like I'm not a big... I'm not a big bat guy i've never been a big bat guy like a guy who loves bat i think is the same guy who's listening to a cassette tape you know what i'm saying <laughs> it's just like and he's got a laser disc at home right so there's new forms of insulation like spray foam but then you guys also have your cellulose which is amazing we have to distinguish between insulation and your air barrier and your vapor barrier in your attic space because of the way we have air movement warm air rises we have to make sure that our ceiling under our wood joists is totally sealed it says airtight as you can have it because the number one problem we have is we have warm air escaping through the top of our uh, buildings residentially commercially that's the biggest source of heat loss is up and out the top of the building there's a couple of critical areas that we have to be conscious of and we have to air seal them one is at all the transitions or the connections between our flooring and our roofing and our and our walls okay. all those header spaces have to be sealed properly second the top of the ceiling we want to seal that. We can do it with a air barrier or a really detailed vapor barrier. Really difficult to do with the vapor barrier because you're always puncturing it. Okay, so you're never going to get a 100% seal. If we're talking about commercial or residential sloped attic space where you have your joists, I would say spray the foam? best way, exactly, go in with a two-pound spray foam, do a minimum of an inch and a half. Skim it. Mm -hmm. Just yep. seal it. You're going to get an air seal, it's a really good air seal, and you're going to get a really good vapor barrier as well. There's one thing about spray foam that we haven't touched on yet. What's that? Spray foam is the only structural insulation on yeah. the market. It has a structural component attached to exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Because it attaches to three surfaces. Two pound spray foam, right? Two pound spray foam. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to be very cognizant of two pound, not half pound, two pound. So it does a number of things. It's a great air barrier. It's a great vapor barrier. Also helps to stiffen up the building. So we're going to air seal our header spaces and our flooring and our ceiling joists. Then we're going to spray in between our ceiling joists. We're getting a really tight building. We're going to stop all that warm, moist air from escaping up into our attic, in and out, out of our building. What you do on top of that spray foam now is less important. If you go bat or if you go cellulose or... The heat. important thing was to air barrier seal it. Exactly. That's the critical thing. Manny, when it comes to energy efficiency, you can have the best insulation. If it's not air sealed, that insulation is not going to work. It's useless at that point. Exactly. Air sealing and insulating go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Challenge is when you see people trying to put six mil poly and a bunch of tuck tape around all those headers and the joists and no. tape, 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 and it's never going to be perfect. You're going to have perfect. holes, right? Exactly. But if you flash it with spray foam on all three sides, like you said, that's sealed. It's sealed. It's sealed and it's good, right? Yep. So that's the best way to do it. Exactly. So with the roof, okay, so now we've tied in from the, there's membranes for the roof, and then mm -hmm. you've got the actual asphalt itself, and it could be mm -hmm. rolled on, it could be shingles. It could be a number of products. could be a number of products. But now let's get back inside the house and the wall assembly, filling in the studding, all the cavities, right? So I, I know, I'm not big on bat, man. I don't like bat. You know, I like we don't bats, need to use bat. right? But bats are great, made out of ash and stuff like that, but I don't like bat insulation, right? So I know I used one of the first guys to use cellulose in Toronto. Huge fan of it. For the reasons that, you know, I got to put a torch to Ben here on while he was holding the product, right? That was fun. I'm like, that. he didn't get burned. Yep. There was no magic trick there. And that was yep. amazing. Then, then you guys tell me that it's like, you know, insect, termite, whatever. Yes. Improve, rodent yeah. mice mm -hmm. so let's take a look at the various products that you can put within your wall assembly we have your fiberglass bats we have your mineral wool bats so your rock so you have glass you got rock you have believe it or not recycled paper mm -hmm. which I know. Is your cellulose. Re recycled wood at but some paper, recycled paper wood. is fast disappearing <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so the so you have that organic product and we got your foam plastics whether it be your spray foam or your other types of uh, board stock what's the biggest problem with our fiberglass and our mineral wool or our stone i don't know they're put in as bats right so it's a pre-manufactured material it's relatively lightweight and one of the things that we're concerned about is durability of our buildings what happens with this material over time gravity grabs it and starts to compress it leaves these big voids in the wall and what happens in these voids you get all this energy that escapes 
you get all this condensation that happens. You have rot, you have mold, you have mildew, you have energy loss. So how do you overcome that? You have to fill the wall to the point where it can't compress. It's self-compressing during the application. That's where your recycled paper or your cellulose comes in. Got it. Cellulose comes in. We fill it to a specific density, three and a half to four and a half pounds per square foot. That's a technical thing. Mm -hmm. We fill it up to where it can't compress yeah. a a any longer. The other advantage over BAT is, again, a pre BAT's a pre-manufactured product. Good luck trying to make it fit around all these electrical boxes, these you plumbing can't. outlets. You can't. They're, ma these. they're manipulating those bags exactly. to a point yeah. where And the, the, the first conscious thing useless. to do as a laborer is just to squish the Keep shit out of it. Keep squishing it pushing it. But which, that's not how insulation works. The more you squish a bat, mm -hmm. the less energy efficient it is. Exactly, right. Or you turn it sideways, you cut it, and they try yeah. to fill in a gap just sliding So now in. that's basically a highway. It's a highway it's for a, air. Yeah, that's all it is at that point. We fill the walls with like a liquid product, which mm -hmm. is the cellulose. We're blowing it in. It yeah. goes around everything. It makes a really tight, energy efficient. It, it wraps around all these defects within the wall, which is your electrical boxes, plumbing, wires, everything. The next, of course, we go to foam plastics. Again, your liquid spray foams, your two pound or your, or your, or your half pound. They attach. They're there forever there. There's no compression. It all comes down to, and I hate to harp on the, the cost aspect. But for a small percentage, we're not talking about massive dollars, we're talking about a little bit extra. You get a building that's going to be healthy, durable, energy efficient for the life of the building. Because insulation is one of those things that it doesn't get changed for the no. life of the building. If you build something today and you put insulation in today, most likely that insulation is not going to be removed. In the wall. In the wall. Mm -hmm. Inside the wall cavity, right? That was the argument in the beginning with spray foam. A lot of guys were like, yeah, good luck on renovating that unit, uh, that corner or whatever. You got to rip all that spray foam apart. And I was like, well, if you're building something custom and it's actually being built properly, you don't want to why it would you be ripping apart that exterior wall? What's the cost of renovating a kitchen? My cost of reality. Like, well, <laughs> You pull the old cabinets down. <laughs> yeah. You put the new cabinets up. What's the cost removing and replacing all that insulation? Oh, it's about the same as those cabinets. First of all, you're moving out of the house because you're ripping open all yeah. the walls. You can't live there when you're renovating to that extent. If you're replacing your kitchen, it could be done within a few days from start to finish. Renovating your walls, upgrading all your insulation, that's weeks, months. But I, I've been in $3 million construction homes and I've seen bats and bats and bats and mm -hmm. bats everywhere. I've seen so much bats and I'm thinking to myself, this is a three, four million dollar built, like five, 6,000 square foot house. At three, four million dollars, you're not, you're talking at thousands of dollars at the most to upgrade that bat to a much better product well, what to they're make doing that house is more efficient. They're, they're talking to their guy. Everybody has a guy. You have your, you have your insulation guy. Some people have more than one guy. That's right. You have your roofing guy. You have your team. Yeah. And the team is going to price the job based on what they know and what they do. So if they're installing fiberglass as their primary source of business, you're getting fiberglass in your home. And if you want to upgrade, it's going to cost them more money because it's not something that they can buy at the same price, right? Because they don't do it that way. They this, don't do it that the way. Time, so right? they're not getting the same deal on a on a fiberglass bat as if they were to upgrade to a mineral wool or they don't do spray foam but because they we're can't. Like, we're literally talking about, at that point, we're talking about pennies is what we're talking about. Oh, we're about, talking about right? pennies. We go back to why they still using fiberglass. It's still code compliant. It's code, eh? Exactly. But that's what everything, all roads lead to. It's true. Everything, every problem you have, it's not the homeowner. It's It goes back to the code. Well, what if, can we get away with? If it's not pretty, the homeowners will defer back to the inspector and builder. And they're yep. going to be like, here, this is your choice. You make a decision on as yep. long as you stay within the budget. Because That's they're not making is. decisions on code. No, they're That's not. That's why I'm they paying don't care you to do it. it. I know. Any of the pretty stuff has nothing to do with code. But how many times have they asked you to change the tile color? Thousands of times, mm -hmm. right? And choose the most expensive ones. And then go back. And, and then all of a sudden, the labor for that install of that expensive tile is increased. Oh, why? How did that happen? Because it's a trick your tile to install right. that's what i'm saying it's just they, they don't care about the installation but then you got to tell them stories about how a house that was a thousand square feet 60 70 years old versus a brand new house that's five thousand square feet five times greater is using less energy to heat and cool manny that says a lot doesn't it when someone's designing a home when someone's building a home, do they ever ask the people, well, how much energy is this house? Never, use? never. never. That's you. never a conversation. That's just stupid. That should be one of the conversations to happen. That should be number one conversation. Yeah. The design from the exterior, number one, you always start with your structure. Next is your membrane and insulation. Yeah. 
How do you protect this house from the elements outside? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then how do you make the house on the inside comfortable? So energy efficiency should be just as important as the color of that tile or that bathroom I fixture. I thousand percent agree with you. It's but man. that's More why important. you have to make it so, like Joe was saying before, that if we can educate these homeowners and say, listen, we have a scale of A to G or whatever it was. Yeah. This is what is going to happen if you pick this or if you pick this. I, I'm going to use a new. I'm going to have a tagline now for all the new clients. Huh? I'm going to be like, no, we A&G. can't go. We can't go with that talk because it doesn't match the uh, building envelope. <laughs> <laughs> They're just going to scratch just their Just to head. keep on keep on bringing it up. Every time I have conversations with the clients, I'm going to keep on bringing up the BE, the building envelope, and I'm going to get, it doesn't match. That kitchen sink will not match that building envelope. We need to address it. They need to... Con- They're spending big money. A huge money on all the pretty shit. And, and, and forget, in my opinion, the I'm building saying, envelope is pretty. more important than anything. Manny, I always say, your wall assemblies, I call it the big cover-up. You cover like it with that. your exterior finish. You cover it with your interior finish. No one knows what happens in between those two. Mm-hmm. It's the cover up. The builder can do whatever he wants. Yeah, it's true. And they're getting away with it. And they they're won't know about it. it. They won't care about no it. No one sees it. And all of a sudden, years down the line, that room is really cold. That room is really warm. That house is not efficient. Manny, I had a great example of a vice president of one of the largest builders in the country. Built his own home. About 10 years later, he decided he was fed up with his master bedroom because it was frozen most of the winter. He couldn't heat it enough. Over the garage? No, it wasn't actually over the garage, but it was a north-facing uh, room. Got it. He had a nice big wall. He opened up his wall. He went to that extent. He said, oh, I, I, must, I have a good air barrier on the building. We opened up his wall, massive voids because of the insulation. Air coming through, I said, first of all, you have no air barrier. Second, your insulation sucks. Well, what's the option? Spray foam it. He spray foamed it, finished it. He's so happy that room is warm, comfortable. He goes, the value, that comfortable, healthy, warm room, you can't compete. It overshadows everything else in there because a cold, damp, drafty room I don't care if you if if it's beautiful, it's unlivable. There's something else going on if it's a cold room like that, and there's more threats inside the cavity, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, so. there's potential mold and mildew. So this health. is a builder of a big company, and that's how his own personal house was built. built. And look, Imagine look, that. Let's look, use the example of my house. My son's room sits above the garage. Forget my bedroom. My bedroom's like I said, it's it's too cold in the in the winter and it's too hot in the summer so i'm assuming i have the similar situation so anyway we we have this this ongoing problem in in production homes so they're they're spraying the top side of the garage the other side of the bedroom with half pound foam you get into his room and it's again it's freezing in the winter hot hot as heck in the summer so how do we address this problem what do we do before you know you take the, the only option was to take down the drywall and either redo it with some better type of spray foam or pack it with insulation uh, bad insulation whatever but now we have cellulose and we're dense packing so okay. from a, a big construction project we made a couple of holes injected cellulose dense packed the whole 20 by 20 area i can tell you the difference is unbelievable so now when you set the thermostat at 22 it's 22 not 19 not 25 isn't that scary that when you set the thermostat is 22 it's actually 22 it's at 22 so when people are not building the houses properly they set the thermostat at 22 then they set it at 24 then they set it at 26 and they keep on they don't realize that every time they keep on increasing that thermostat their bill keeps on increasing as well too (laughs) consumption right right? so you you going back just saying you know doing insulation properly you know depending on whatever your available op there are options out there without being so invasive but they don't want to see them and they'll only pay attention to them later on when they move in there and they have the first year and then they start comparing all the utility bills mm-hmm. Manny, that or, goes but down. it goes back to the comfort it wasn't even about the utility it was just my son is my son you care about him you want you want any family member to be comfortable uh, like and i said I can't the organic stand, food i know i can't stand when he's freezing or when he's hot and he's coming into my room and he's not comfortable in the previous home there was nothing i could do because it was a similar situation yeah. so what do you do but luckily we we've uh we got into this technology we have the equipment we have all these things tried it out and it was like night and day and it, it literally took 50 bags of cellulose which is not expensive at all they're cheap aren't they how much are they nine to ten bucks a bag a bag a bag people are spending more on coffees at starbucks yeah <laughs> i'm sorry you get a muffin you're over 10 bucks right there you got it man. i'm sorry to say but it's true so manny comes yes. down to <laughs> the purchaser being educated yes the builder being honest <laughs> Oh, I, I realize that. That's why we have codes, because we know that not everyone's honest. But it comes down to everyone along the line trying to adhere to a certain level of quality. Is it 
is it taboo to talk about building envelope? Like, is it to the point where I don't care about this conversation? I don't want to have it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to see it on the budget line. I don't. Not anymore. No, not anymore. It used to be though. It's very important it's, now. People are taking it extremely seriously. They're now. seeing where the utility rates are going. So I don't even think it's the well. Aside from the utility, I think it's just the performance of the wall yeah. and the damage that could come from it if it's not done correctly. That's the problem. Is everyone's getting scared because now we've have enough. People that go in and they make livings off of this, doing these inspections and doing remedial work, and how do we fix this? And buildings are are falling apart. I think after you're also getting years. a lot of homeowners that are working from home. They're working remotely, so they're staying in their homes a lot longer. They're not like waking up in the morning, take off, and then the house is all quiet Possibly. for the day, and then they come back at the end of the night. Yep. So if they're spending their entire day at home now from working from home, mm -hmm. they're like, why is the house cold? Why is the yep. house this? I didn't even realize this, right? So you're getting a lot of those professionals. So the idea is that we want to. This has been a great talk. I almost feel like we got to continue like an, another one. We got to do another updated one in a few months. There's a lot more shit that we could talk about as well too. You can do probably just another hour of Joe and and Code. Yeah, because Code is like he hasn't even gone to Ashray yet. So you like. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so I, I want to wrap it up. But I mean, the the idea is that there's. You got to get this conversation going. Yes. You got to have this conversation with the homeowners. You got to have this conversation with the builders. You got to have this conversation with the trades. That's what I did as a business owner mm -hmm. is that I made all my trades, everybody conscious of this conversation. I didn't want electricians and plumbers and everybody else to come in here and not be respectful of that building envelope and not be like, I don't care about that. Just cut a hole here, rip it and put it in here and done. No, you can't be doing that to the house. But you also want, you want the clients to be conscious of this. It's really important that they should speak about this do their YouTube searches, do their Google searches, do all their other searches and find out what are the best things to do out there. Don't be afraid of certain things because you heard horror stories of spray foam or shit like that, right? So I think that it's important that we continue these conversations because these homeowners, after the second home that they buy, I, I feel, they're a lot more conscious. And once that child shows up, they're a lot more conscious about how their house is going to behave. Any last thoughts there, Joe and Ben? If we truly want to be good, stewards of this earth and we really want to reduce our carbon footprint the number one thing is let's control how much energy we use to heat and cool our homes that's the biggest impact we can have right now today and that will last decades to centuries that will go forward for the life of the building yeah, and we should be building homes that are not going to last decades we should be building homes that are going to be century homes we mm -hmm. want we want to look at subdivision homes well, that's that's our, our attitude are we building homes for landfill or for future that's generations. true. Because that's just that's just a waste. Why not build it so then it lasts a long, long time? So then it goes back to the old school ways of where you bought a house 100, 200 years ago, and it got handed down to a family member. It got handed down, kept on getting handed down, mm -hmm. right? Yep. They don't do that now. They're just for sale sign, leave, because things are falling apart in this house. We don't want to solve it. We don't want to care about it. We are not going to rip all these walls up and change all the insulation. We're not going to do any of this mm -hmm. crap. Forget that. We're moving, right? Yeah. No, you got to make homes so then people don't want to move. Once they planted their roots and they've established everything their friends are there the school's there their favorite neighborhood their favorite restaurant their favorite everything is there yeah. they want that house to be built the way we should be built uh yeah I, just to touch on what joe was saying if if people really want to educate themselves uh, you know social media is a great tool uh, certainly on our website suprema.ca there's lots of educational videos courses you can take or look or webinars that we we, we show people but and, you guys and have see hundreds if not thousands of products yeah but it's it's not even about the product it's about again the assembly the assembly right of the products. so it gives you an idea of what you should be looking for and then is it better i'm a, i'm gonna assume that it's better to educate all the builders first and the trades first and let them speak for you guys to get to the clients well look what we're doing right now i mean we're at our we're at our office upstairs we have a training going on like i said we've talked about this i know before. i couldn't could find a parking spot yeah there's the class is full they're doing a waterproofing session right now but it's one of you know we do walls we do roofing we do consultant training it's we get these people in here you know 40 to 50 people at a time and we we try to educate. So to get more information, we just go to suprema.ca or suprema.com, depending on what Supreme, side. Yeah, if you're in the States, it's suprema.com, and then up here, it's suprema.ca. And then you could just do a Google, you could do a search in there, right? You could yeah. just do a search and search find the product walls. that you want to find, because yeah. you guys have a lot of products, right? A lot of right. products. Otherwise, contact builders like myself or other builders mm -hmm. that are conscious of stuff, stuff that the products that we've used yep. on site, and actually we know about them, right? Mm -hmm. And then you guys are more than willing to answer any questions. They call the office, we call them back, we'll meet you on site, whatever you need. That's what we're here for. Because you guys are primarily about educating. It's Correct. not about selling specific product. No. It's about educating them how to use these products. Correct. And if our product works, 
then by all means use it. But there are some good it's products. It's not selling that, the most expensive product. No. That's that's the beautiful thing about us. We don't manufacture it's one It's selling type. the most educated it's assembly. It's gonna, what's going to fit yes. for your situation, for your budget. All right. So I was asking Ben the other day, is it Suprema or Suprema? Suprema or Suprema? Suprema. Easy, say <laughs> Suprema. He's confident. <laughs> I've been saying Suprema. Is it Doesn't Suprema? I, I hear, I both told of you. them? Potato, potato. Joe, we're really both potato, nice. potato. We can't forget this out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a great talk. Uh, I always love talking about this stuff, man. This stuff is more fascinating to me than kitchen countertops. This was speaking. fun, yeah. Thank you again, Joe. Thank you again, Ben. Thanks, Thanks again, everybody at Suprema here, just to let us uh, park our podcast set up here. And... <sighs> I think we have to have more talks like this, man. There's more information to share, and uh, I'm looking forward to those conversations. Love it. Thanks, Manny. Thanks, Thanks, guys.